So we just wanted to show this one more time prior to going into the wages discussion where the labor supply and demand is shifting and you're, and you're getting this, this shift where the openings is much bigger than the supply. And, and we've seen that with just not as many people in the job market. You know, we've talked aggressively uh, about how we're not seeing the labor participation rates. And then we just got a, another data point today when you look at what the, what the United States pulled in on the uh, on the jobless on the initial jobless claims, where the their the initial jobless claims were expected to be uh, at two hundred five uh, two hundred five thousand came in at one eighty six. So you you're not seeing the softness there, which is why when you look at the workforce, where filled and open jobs and the workforce in general, how it's flipped and why that's going to become a bigger problem on the wages side. So when you look at on the wages front, you're seeing this bigger pivot where wages are staying a bit elevated, which is going to leave costs higher for, for companies. But what is that doing? You know, because even as wages stay elevated, well, inflation staying elevated. They there has been a slight flip to positive on the real on the real wages side, but the current pace of savings drawdown is very fast and getting faster as we've been talking about it overall. And you can see how quickly you've had that drop in terms of the bottom uh, quartile, second quartile, and that and the like. But the drive, different drivers of excess savings, when you look at what was driving it, the top quartile is the largest driver. And the question is, what is the top quartile doing with that money? And that's where we see a bigger problem in general when we look at different pressure points on inflation, on wages, and and again, where are people going to put their investment dollars? So 99% of households' financial assets are at or below pre-pandemic levels if they're adjust if we adjust these by debt. And that's the biggest problem when you look at the debt side, which is, and and we've talked about this before, even though the debt is more manageable in terms of cost, there's still a much bigger outlay. So not to say that anybody's going to call in their uh, their mortgage or not to say any bank is, but you're also underwater, which is why we've talked about golden handcuffs. It's like, sure, you can, you can afford that mortgage at that rate. But you can't sell the home because the equity you you're not going to get the equity back to pay off that that the principal, and that's the biggest problem of this these these golden handcuffs, which is going to keep people a bit locked in where they are. When you look at some of the pressure points on the on, on the the pressure on uh, debt, the pressure on how that's continuing to grow, we've seen it with debt with uh, credit cards. Credit card debt is is back at a record. It, it crossed over and then has just accelerated, even though credit card rates are at the highest they've ever been, taking out the previous high of 1985. But when you start looking at the employed full time, the medium, uh, you you usual weekly real average, you can see it's just now back above positive. But even as it's above positive, you're still seeing okay, well what are people actually seeing on the inflation side? Because this is assuming the inflation that is currently, you know, given to the market. But anybody that has gone to the supermarket knows that, okay, you're telling me that if food is up 11%, 12%. It's like everything I bought except two things is up way more than that. You know, my, my wife, I, we talked about the eggs before, but so she, we used, we have three children. So she buys two loaves that the, if you've ever been to BJ's or I'm sure they have it at Costco, same thing. You buy two loaves in one bag and that used to be $2.99. Now it's $4.59. Uh, again, that that's a big jump when you look at it. And, and so what is real, what is not is always just, this is the data. We're, we're showing it to you. We're, we're saying this is what it is. This is what they're saying. But then you have to look at it in terms of how is that applied to you and your daily life? And is it real or fake? Liquid assets grew across all income groups, but most notably for the top 20% income group, which is what we've been talking about. And then liquid assets per household are up significantly. But again, it's, it's grossly weighted towards one side. And then if you if you factor this in with where credit is, it's like, okay, well, 
what kind of assets? Because if assets were this large, why is credit increasing at such a level? Why are delinquencies on, on cars increasing to such a level? Cars is interesting because people are like, well, I can't afford this. I can't afford this one. I'm going to let this, I'm going to let this uh, go into uh, receivership. I'll let it default and I'll just go get a new car loan. And that's something that is happening just because these cars are not worth what uh, the initial borrow was. Now, change in household net worth to income ratio is interesting because you can see it's negative. And, and that's what we've talked about in previous times in terms of the change in household net worth to income. And, and that's important when you look at net worth, which is looking at assets, both real estate, you know, their portfolios and how that has come down. And that's when people feel the poor, like poorer when you see these asset prices and these restrikes showing something worse. So the wealth destruction, the drop in real household net worth, as you can see in general, again, the worst ever is just looking at the biggest drop, but you're dropping from a very high number. So even though it's the biggest drop in history, it doesn't mean that people are more destitute now than they were in, in 2001 or, or 2008. It's just showing that it, it's been a, a precipitous, uh, precipitous drop, and, but there's very little to see that pop back to what we talked about in the first segment where we showed you what was happening on the real estate side and how there's a ton of distressed debt and the real estate piece of the equation on a global level is a problem. And that's how a lot of these individuals got or looked at their wealth on a household net worth component. And as that household falls in terms of the value of the home, that's going to impact that underlying wealth. So then when you look at total spending plans, you're like, well, spending plans for the, uh, for the 100,000 plus and then total non-essential, non-essential spending plans for the 100,000 plus is dropping. And it just looks at, well, people aren't spending the same way at the highest qu- uh, quartile, quintile, depending on how you break it up. So when, but what does that mean? Well, well, U.S. consumption. So the, when you look at the share of total consumption ex, uh, expenditures, it's the top It's the top quintile. So, well, what does that mean where if people are expecting to spend less, that's going to pull things further and that's going to reduce retail sales, going to pull down that spending. And that's where we start to see this rollout. And this is the conundrum we fall under because some of the data is like, well, people are in good shape. And then other sides of the data, it's like, well, people aren't in good shape. So the, what we like to do is look at all the data and then weigh which one is going to matter the most. And for us, it's look at what people are doing with their actual dollars. Savings are at an all-time low. Uh, savings rate, all-time low. Credit card debt, all-time high. Securitized debt, all-time high. Those are things that don't happen when people are flush with cash in the bank. You know, Now you look at spending expenditures going forward and people are reducing. That's, again, not something that happens when people are flush with cash. So we think that some of the savings data is overstated. And it, and again, it's just the law of numbers of a small subset of people have most of that money and it's not evenly distributed by any means, which is creating some of this, this, uh, this skew in the data sets. And then the U.S. global manufacturing PMI expected to be at 46, came in at 46.8, still an underlying problem in contraction, but the future output data has gotten better. So when you look at the glo- the U.S. manufacturing, you know the there's an, a a hope that you're going to get a a bump in in activity. And as we, if for those that have been watching us, we had said that Q1 is going to be a problem, but we didn't. Do, there was very little activity in Q4 and Q1. But you still need stuff. You still need inventory. So our view is that Q2 is going to be a bit better. And and this data of future output which if it's in January, so if it happens the next two to three years, that's that March into April period where people are like, well, you know, we still need stuff. People are still buying some things. It's just, are they buying the same level? Well, no, but you still need that activity, which is why we we do expect to see things get a bit better. But holistically speaking, when you look at the manufacturing PMI, it's still going to be in contraction, but there's still going to be some, some, again, some staying power at this reduced level without getting back to this expansion. Input prices bouncing higher. Input prices for manufacturing bouncing higher. Input prices for services bouncing higher. Again, 
stagflation that everyone keeps expecting this big drop and it's just the rate of change it's and and this is the kind of thing where it never went into contraction we were always expanding on input prices just at a slower rate and that rate is now accelerating now we don't see it be, getting this huge surge but it's going to stay to the higher side it's going to remain elevated and we see a lot of this uh, uh this 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 capacity to stay at the higher end again driving that inflation conversation now when you look at u.s services the expectation was for 45 came in at 46.6 still contraction but again when you look going forward employment came negative so but again 49.7 that's a so that's a rounding error which is essentially saying we're we're here and that's the problem when you look at bouncing around it's it's are we we're improving off of a weaker base so the we're still in contraction that's not changing but even if as we're in contraction prices are going up and that means costs are going up that's wages that's you know gasoline that's diesel those are things that continue to creep higher again in supporting that stagflationary backdrop Non-manufacturing index from Philly ticked higher in January, still contracting, but it went from 12.8 to 6.5. And as we keep saying, nothing dies in a straight line. You know, you have some of these bouncing back and forth. New orders back to expansion and full-time employment recovered from the dip lower in December. But again, that's new orders are going to expand a bit. You know, you can't be continuously contracting. Your people still need stuff. They're still going to put in orders. And that's just playing out again. But when you look at the general trend, the trend still is downward and we don't we don't see a big pivot off of that trend basis. U.S. real wages, real average earnings continue to move down. So as we said before, you know, real wages are slightly up. But when then when you average it out, when you look at where we are, it's still firmly negative, which is why we still see some of these pressure points on the uh, on the spending front. Manufacturing index uh, for Philly, again, expected 11, came in at negative 8.9. Philadelphia manufacturing new orders bounced to negative 10.9. And it's not that anything, it's really hard to continue negative. It's just you kind of find a floor and then you bounce up and down within that time frame, which is why we continue to see a lot of these underlying pressure points. Manufacturing work week came in at negative 6.9, so moving into contraction. Expected number of employees, negative 1.9. So there's, again, more of that pressure on the Philly side. Regional data is all going to, is just gauging their, their specific region, and that's always going to fluctuate. But it's important to understand how each place is, is interacting and what is going to be the biggest driver for that month. And here you can see that Philly is showing something a bit worse than some of the others. And that's going to be, it's just a matter of where is the general movement and what direction is it going? Philadelphia manufacturing prices paid, still an expansion, but at a slowing rate. And you can see some of these different pieces as to where. New York Fed service business activity, negative 21.4. So things have gotten ex. ex uh, you know, exponentially worse in the in New York on the services side. And that's a bigger problem because remember, services is the driver for where we are on the uh, uh, on the just GDP growth, where services is a big part of a lot of that growth. So then when you look at R Richmond Fed, so prices paid component uh, manufacturing index continues to plunge from its peak, but still elevated versus pre-pandemic average. So yes, are we at 7.91? Absolutely. Where did we peak at 15? Yes. But 7.91 is still the highest it's ever been going back to 1997, taking out that, again, that spike higher. So it's still expanding. There's still inflationary pressures. It's not at the extremes that it was, but it doesn't mean that it's reversing, which is, again, more of that disinflation, not deflation. It's just we're still getting inflation just at a much slower rate of change, which is what we've been talking about and leads us more into a stagflationary backdrop and less on an inflation or deflation as of right now. So then the manufacturing index for the Richmond Fed uh, fell in January to negative 11 versus the estimate of negative five. New order sank to negative 24. Backlogs fell deeper into contraction. Lead times bounced higher, but still in contraction and employment dipped to its lowest since July 2020. So again, you're still seeing a lot of these flows, a lot of these pressure points. 
And that's why looking at multiple different regions is good to get an idea of how each part of the country is doing and how that's going to line up for the for the holistic you know, national data. And Richmond Fed manufacturing wages had a big bounce. So prices paid came down, but wages reversed. Now, wages going up is going to make some of those prices sticky, and you're going to have to try to pass on that cost, which is why prices paid, we still think, is going to remain elevated. And the wages coming back up, showing that there's a lot of staying power on that inflationary side. Uh, skills gap continues to fade as a major issue for both manufacturing and services based on the Richmond Fed with Philly Fed business activity, new orders, again, showing some of that balance. So just to kind of balance out Philly Fed saying one thing, but others are, are starting to show some of those cracks. Now, home builder sentiment was expected at 31, came at 35, bouncing off the lows, prospective buyers bouncing a bit off the lows. But again, it's not like it's a full recovery. It's just you get to a point and then you kind of bounce sideways, which is what we're seeing here. Some 644,000 homes were bought in 2022, smallest annual total in four years as, again, monetary policy adjusted that, pushing wages higher. Combined with prices that were slow to decline, home buying conditions worst in a generation. And then it's interesting because if you look at 08, you know, the months of supply is, 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 is increasing. You know, right now we have a total of nine months in supply. But look at what's under construction. And that's the biggest backdrop in terms of where some of these flows are because are, what is the risk of buying something that's under construction? You know, can I do it at the price that it's currently at? Is there going to be a loss that the builder is going to take? You know, how much of this exposure is someone willing to take an under and what's under construction? Or are you going to try to add units if it's not already sold? And there's a lot of, you know, some interactions with this. And but it also helps support some of that base metals and, and some of the raw materials because things are still under construction. You, you maybe you haven't taken all the deliveries of all the inputs. So that could also cr uh, create some of that staying power on the base uh, base side. New privately owned housing units under construction, you five or more units. It's at a record, taking out the highs from the 70s. Housing starts and completions on those on those five plus units starts have increased uh, at a very big level, but completions still remain low. So as that new capacity comes on, that's going to put more pressure on underlying pricing. U.S. existing home sales, as you can see for 2022, coming in at that bottom. U.S. existing home sales year over year uh, in December came in at negative 36.3, and it took out the lows from 2008. And then mortgage purchase index has risen by 29% over the past uh, two weeks, which is the fastest two-week change uh, since November of 2008. Level is still incredibly low relative to history, but again, it's it's just when you look at where we were in 2008, you had a little bit of a uh, pop and then a fade. This is something where we think there's a more downside, especially as rates continue to drift higher. We still expect more Fed rate hikes, which is going to put some of these rates uh, to a higher level once again. Month of supply available on the market, you can see here it's at four months. It's still a, a bit low versus 2020. Median asking price is up 3.9% year on year, so still at the high end, which is why we still see more of this pressure to the downside because pricing is has to come down further given where incomes are, given where debt is, given where, um, where mortgage rates are, which is why we still see more pressure. So that's what we have for you here. But I, I should say, as and because there's more pressure, that's going to impact wealth. Uh, that's going to have a wealth effect where people will feel less, quote unquote, wealthy, which is going to put more pressure going forward on how much people spend and borrow. So that's what we have for you on the U.S. side. In the next segment, we're going to go deeper into Europe and what's happening on the European front.